Hey, I'm Laura. How are you? Ahlan wasahlan, masal khair. Welcome to the U.S. Elections Night Owl. Um, I've been calling it affectionately the Rumble in Rabat. Um, we hope we'll have a serious, substantive debate, but just in case, I dress for a bullfight. Um, we've got four fearsome players in the ring. Um, let's see, if I'm talking about power players, we're going to start with Hillary. She's on every power list in Washington. She's on the list of most powerful women. She's always at the top of the list for most powerful operatives, Washington insiders. I don't know, political strategists under the age of 40, in a couple of years, maybe over the age of 40. Um, but she also made a really important list this year, which is Mitt Romney's. Um, she's a Democrat, and he was talking to Republican donors. And first he talked about the Palestinians, the problems with the Palestinians, and then he went on to talk about that 47% of Americans who will never vote for him. And then he started to talk about what's her name, Hillary Rosen. And you could hear the sound of checks ripping out of Republican checkbooks as they were writing, oh, Hillary Rosen, that'll be good for $10,000 for the Romney campaign. <laughs> um, Hillary works for a really important political consulting firm. She's the managing director. And not only did her firm help put Barack Obama in office, they also helped elect Benjamin Netanyahu. So next time you're watching television and there's some story about the world leaders not getting along, you know who to thank. Um, to her right, literally and figuratively, is Grover Norquist. Um, a lot of you probably recognize Grover from television. His title is the founder and the president of the Americans for Tax Reform. Sounds innocent enough. Um, but in fact, <laughs> Harry Reid, the Senate, Democratic Senate Majority Leader, described Grover as the second most important man in Washington after the president, and it wasn't a compliment, right? <laughs> um, the Huffington Post described Grover as the dark wizard of the rights anti-tax cult. Now, I'm not quite sure what that is, but I want to be that for Halloween. I'm going to dress my three kids up as the dark wizard of the anti-tax cult, and we'll see how trick-or-treating goes. Um, Grover actually is quite simple. When he was 12 years old, he decided to brand the Republican Party. And this is a true story. Mm -hmm. He was riding home on the bus, and he was thinking about, I'm not sure why you were thinking about this, but Coca-Cola and Pepsi. And he said, you know, the Republican Party needs a clear, understandable brand. Now, what is it that you think about when you think about Republicans? No, not that. <laughs> um, you think about no new taxes. And that's what Grover decided would be the brand of the Republican Party. And what that means is if any congressman or senator decides to raise the taxes, that would be like you're drinking your Coca-Cola and you look at the bottom of the bottle and you find a rat head. This is Grover's language in the bottle of the Coke bottle. So we're sticking with Heineken for the night. Um, over here, we have Peter Beinart. He is the boy genius of the Democratic Party. Um, he's a professor of political science. His books and his columns in foreign policy are as controversial as they are influential. And there's two kinds of people who read Peter in Washington, aside from the Obama administration, which is a given. There are those people who agree with Peter, and they put his books on their bookshelf as a sign of badge of pride. And then there are those people who don't agree with Peter. They still read his books, and they keep them under the mattress, because they're confounding, but they're compelling reading. Um, over here, we have Dove Zakheim. He's a Republican defense policy expert. And if you see any kind of Republican foreign policy experts in a huddle, Dove is in the thick of it. Um, he was the Under Secretary of Defense under President Bush, heavily involved in Afghanistan and Iraq. I remember when I first moved to Washington, I somehow bumbled into a dinner that was honoring you. I didn't really know how important you were, but I saw every defense contractor and weapons maker out there with pom-poms <laughs> doing the Dove dance. Um, so the watch out for dance. this chair, because there's a lot of firepower behind That's Dove. That's going to stick, the Dove dance. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really want to thank you for coming out tonight, because in some ways, the 2012 election could be easily dismissed. But when you think about 2008, what did you have? Hope and change. And now we have 2012, and there's been a lot of hype, and there's been a lot of chaff. Um, the president of America right now, there are many Americans who feel like he hasn't done a great job, but he's being challenged by somebody who people fear might do a worse job. And let's face it, the level of discourse in this campaign has been pretty low. If you watch the political ads, I don't know if you have, but 
you might think it was a contest between entitled moochers versus the elitist moguls. So I think before we start, especially with this international group, um, I want to ask the four panelists an important question. Why do we care? Why does this election even matter? Because it would be easy to say that it doesn't really matter very much. So I want to, this is a two-part question for all of you. First of all, looking out into the world, how will it impact the gentleman from Ghana or the woman from Portugal or from the Philippines? Looking out into the world, what, what, how will this election resonate globally? And then I also want you to take the telescope that you're looking at into the world. What does planet Romney look like? What is Comet Obama right off with no re-election to worry about? Look out there, but then take the, take the telescope and turn it on yourself. And I want you to tell me how the policies that you're debating will affect you personally. And I don't mean who's going to make more money <laughs> if the Democrats win or the Republicans. I mean, how will this really affect somebody who you care about or yourselves? So I'm going to throw, this is going to be a jump ball. Peter, you're smiling, so I'm going to pick on you. Um, I, I actually don't think that the foreign policies of Romney and Obama will be that dramatically different, because I think if you look at American history, what tends to determine far, presidents' foreign policies are the, the hands, the cards that they're played, the kind, um, the, number, the, the kind of resources they have available in terms of money and military strength and public will, and whoever is president in 2013, the hands, the cards they'll be playing will be very weak. America's run out of money to do the kinds of, some of the big kind of things that, uh, that it wanted to do around the world. And I think that it's going to be a relatively cautious foreign policy by comparative perspective regardless. But I think domestically the consequences are really huge because the country has to deal with this massive deficit and it's either going to do so in a way that really guts the, the social compact that was, found, that was started in the United States during Franklin Roosevelt and after World War II in a way that will exacerbate the already just mind-boggling and frightening level of income inequality in the United States, or it will do those very, very tough choices in a way that is more egalitarian, in a way that does cut Medicare and healthcare spending, but also forces Americans at the top to pay a bit more and deals with the defense spending. Um, so I think that's going to, and I think that will impact how people see the United States because it will impact the, what their vision of the American model will be, particularly because if Romney and his vision wins, especially with the Supreme Court, it won't just be that income equality becomes even greater, but the few remaining barriers we have to the ability of the very wealthy to buy elections in the United States will also be repealed. And so our democracy will also grow significantly weaker. Personally, you know, I have to say, I tend to think about my sister-in-law. My sister-in-law is, uh, is a doctor in the army. When her first daughter was two, she was sent to Iraq for a year. Uh, and had, then she came back and had another baby, and then had to leave both of her small daughters to go and spend six months in Afghanistan. And I was more upset the second time, because by the second time she was sent, essentially sending her family into a kind of chaos, you may be aware that we don't have great childcare systems, for instance, in the United States. She was being sent to a war that Americans had already forgotten about. And barely anyone in America, Mitt Romney didn't even mention the war in Afghanistan in his acceptance speech. And now I contemplate the possibility, if we don't get out of Afghanistan relatively quickly, that my sister-in-law could be sent back again for a war that most Americans basically assume is over, and almost all foreign policy wonks basically think we've already lost. That, to me, is a truly frightening prospect. So that's what I think about. Thanks, Peter. Hillary. Um, I agree with everything Peter said, except for the fact that, I, that this election won't have much impact globally. I, I think it does. Um, and I start with a sort of a basic premise, that th the President of the United States uh, controls the military, controls spending, controls foreign aid, but the president also imparts a sense of values that, that America has had historically and uh, I think over the last uh, several years has restored uh, globally, which um, I think we won't know the impact of an, uh, the aggressive invasion of Iraq and its reputation on America for, for 25, 30 years, but I think history is going to judge it harshly. And I think that President Obama's 
perspective of having grown up in, in, for many years uh, in Indonesia gives him a sense of, of global compatibility and global engagement that Mitt Romney just does not have, that has not been exhibited uh, by the Republicans in the United States for many years, um, maybe since, I don't know, Richard Nixon. Uh, and, and what I think that we get from President Obama is not just sort of a commitment to uh, uh, AID, which is vast, not just a Secretary of State with the um, dynamism and values of Hillary Clinton, which are phenomenal, but we, we get a president that actually uh, cares about the people around the world in, in a fundamental way and, and doesn't see the conflict between caring about the global community versus caring about the U.S. I think we've seen the Romney campaign be relatively bombastic over the last few months about their views globally, trying to drive a wedge between, for instance, supporters of Israel versus supporters of, of the peace process when we know that that is not a divide that's particularly practical. Um, so I, I do think it has a significant impact. For me personally, um, I, I think as a, as a, as a woman and, and, a, and a mom, you know, it's hard to explain the impact that this, this what, what are derisively in the United States political arena called the social issues have on this, on this campaign. Whether it's, you know, what Mitt Romney's for a, um, a healthcare system that discriminates against women's reproductive choices, whether it's, uh, or paying for, uh, requiring insurance companies to pay for women's health at the same level they, it pays for men's health, whether we have um, basic rights to pay, to reproductive decisions, whether gays and lesbians are welcomed for their families, whether our immigrant um, friends and, and family are welcomed for their um, contributions to the United States instead of worrying about whether they'll be deported or discriminated against. Those are the kinds of things I think that most drive me in this election. Uh, because I don't think there's any question, everyone wants the economy to get better. And I don't think we can separate those two things. I think uh, having whole and valued people encourages those people to be whole and valued and productive members of the economic system that drives the innovation in our country. Dove. Well, I agreed with the very first couple of sentences that Hillary... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm getting there. <laughs> Until she mentioned the president. <laughs> um, but Hillary's right. Uh, what we do matters. What the president of the United States does matter. Uh, and the impact on the world is, is still very, very significant. We've heard panels these last couple of days talk about maybe a rising powers, the so-called rest. Um, but we still count. One of the major differences, I believe, between uh, Mr. Romney and the Republicans generally, uh, and Mr. Obama, uh, is this whole question of American exceptionalism. It's not that we think we're superior to everybody, but we're the necessary condition. In fact, it was my good friend with whom I rarely agree, Madeleine Albright, who called us the indispensable power. It is very, very difficult to do anything successfully on an international basis without the United States leading. And I don't mean leading from behind. I mean leading. And what we're seeing in my country today is a significant cut in defense as if the North Koreans or the Iranians or terrorists anywhere really care about our tax problems. That's not why you spend money on defense. And our posture is there to reassure people so if we're going to move our, the bulk of our military capability to East Asia, and we really can't, and I'll get back to that in a minute, but if we were, does that mean the Middle East is going to say, okay, everything will be quiet because you want to move your forces to East Asia? And oh, by the way, if we're cutting our budget by $500 billion, $487 billion to be exact, I used to manage money in the Pentagon, so I keep my numbers pretty clear. Now we have this new sequester, as it's called, it's a automatic cuts. Managing cost. money in the Pentagon. Sorry, <laughs> that sentence, managing money in the Pentagon. It was just well, it's because you've <laughs> never been there. It can be done. Um, 
Now we have this new problem of another 492 billion that's going to be cut, nearly a trillion dollars from defense. The president has not involved himself, not at all, left it to the Congress, and holds defense hostage to tax fights. Now, I'm not going to talk about taxes, because we've got probably the nation's foremost expert on taxes sitting to my right. I don't know why they put me at the extreme left. I, I'm not. <laughs> but if we are going to cut our defenses by that amount, what credibility are we going to have to reassure allies? What credibility are we going to have to keep enemies in their place? All we will do is encourage aggression, encourage more crises. And it's true, a president deals with the hand that he is given. Since Hillary Clinton didn't run, it's only a he this year. But you affect that hand. You encourage that hand. You cannot say, oh, the world is on top of me and I'll react. That's what's been going on for four years. And sometimes there was no reaction. What happened to the green movement in Iran? Here we've heard talk and talk and peace prizes, no less, about hope, about freedom, and I'm all for it. Tell that to the Iranian people. So to me, it makes a huge difference to the world outside, not how we are resolving our domestic economic issues. There are lots of different ways to do it. Reasonable people can disagree. Democrats and Republicans can disagree. Liberals and conservatives can disagree. But the world cares more about what we do on the outside. And my personal view is we've lost that credibility. In terms of my personal, uh, how it affects me personally, thank God I've got 10 grandchildren. And I'm the son of immigrants. And I did pretty well relative to my parents. And my children are actually doing pretty well relative to me. But their children, I'm not so sure. And I think that there is a difference between giving people equal opportunity and fundamentally coming at a problem through redistribution. And I've had too many members of the European Parliament tell me, why are you people trying to do what we tried 20 and 25 years ago? And look where we are today. Is that what we want? That's my personal concern. I want my grandchildren to do better than my children. In any event, everyone knows that the enemy of your children is your grandchildren. Your, actually, Doe's granddaughter is in my son's class in second grade. And I asked my son about her, and he said, you know, she's that kid. You know, every, every class has this one kid who's really good. Well, that's your granddaughter. So. Yeah, well, she's not like her granddad. What can I tell you? So, uh, Grover, over to you. Sure. On, on economics, if Romney's elected president, there'll be a Republican Senate in the House with it, and you can write the script of what will happen. It's written down. It looked very much like the Ryan budget plan, which has actually been passed uh, overwhelmingly in the Republican House already and gotten the votes on the Republican Senate. It does three significant things. It takes uh, all the means-tested welfare programs, the programs that go to lower-income people, and it does for them, this is uh, Medicaid, uh, food stamps, there's 77 major ones, 187 total means-tested welfare programs at the national level, and it does for them exactly what Bill Clinton did for aid to families with dependent children. It block grants them to the states, it allows them to grow with inflation uh, and with population, but not beyond that. So that's one, and it, over time, it allows states to do what they did with uh, welfare under uh, Clinton's proposals to try different things and find out uh, what works. Obama hated that at the time, he hates it now. Um, Bill Clinton used to brag about it, he now describes the Republican plan, which is his plan, as a bad thing, but it's replicating something that worked. Uh, the second part of that is moving the defined benefit pension plans, both uh, for employment uh, and for things like meta um, care, towards defined contribution plans. Uh, there's a plan that was actually worked out with Alice Rivlin uh, and uh, Democratic Senator Bro, uh, and most recently, Democratic Senator from uh, Oregon, along with Ryan, uh, which reforms the Medicare program, which saves money, but gives, does the saving through competition rather than through rationing. Those are the two big ones, and then reductions in domestic discretionary uh, spending that doesn't fall into entitlements. 
you do that plan, you take spending from 24% of GDP down to 20% uh, of GDP within a decade and down to 16% of GDP going into 20, uh, uh, 2050. It actually pays off the national debt by allowing economic growth to make this, the economy grow faster than the government with two programs, both of which have been endorsed bipartisanly and both of which have worked uh, in other cases. Uh, and not scary or different, but very helpful. Uh, if Obama wins, uh, we know what Obama would do with the Democratic House and Senate. We lived for two years, his first two years with that. He gave us another entitlement program that isn't paid for, uh, raised 20 different taxes, uh, didn't reform any entitlement programs or reduce any spending, and he's got a budget that he just put forward for 2012 and the next decade, which increases the debt 11 trillion, uh, total debt increase 11 trillion over the next 10 years. Now, he doesn't have a Democratic House and Senate, so I'm not sure how much of that he can do, but that would be his plan. He'll have to deal with the Republican House and maybe the Republican Senate were he to be elected. That's the big difference on economics. Foreign policy, uh, Obama came in, kept Gitmo going, tripled the number of troops in Afghanistan. Um, how different he was from Bush? No. Um, on Iraq, he was on Bush's timetable. On Afghanistan, he was on Bush's timetable. Uh, how different Romney would be from the present uh, president, I'm not certain. Uh, as for me personally, I have a three and a half and a four year old uh, child. I live in Washington, D.C. I'd like to stay in the city. Uh, and uh, one of the first official acts that Obama, President Obama did when he became president was to end the school choice program, the scholarship program for kids in D.C., 1,600 particularly low income kids who are given a chance to go to private schools because the D.C. schools do not graduate the people who enter them. They do not do well. It's a failed system. It spends almost as much money for the government-run schools as for Obama's rich kid private school that he sends his kids to, but his school succeeds and the D.C. schools fail. Um, one of the big differences between Republicans and Democrats is whether they're able to work for the kids and parents or whether they have to do what the teachers unions tell them to. In his first test, Obama said, screw the kids, I'm with the teachers unions, and a lot of children lost the chance of choice in D.C. Uh, as you're seeing across the United States, the teachers unions are f losing that fight state by state, but I think there's a big difference having a president who can say no to the teachers union rather than one who takes so much money from them that he tells young kids in D.C., I don't care about your future, I'm with the teachers union, not with you. Uh, I think that his approach was a bad one. I think it's bad for the kids, and I don't want his hands on my kids' future. Grover, I'm going to hang on to you for a minute and talk to you about the economy. Um, you all know the saying, it's the economy stupid. Almost every election is about a referendum on the economy. But if the American economy is struggling, I think we'd all agree that the European economy is really sputtering. Right? We heard about this week France is raising taxes. In Spain, they're instituting austerity measures, which includes raising taxes. The people are in the streets protesting. They're not too happy about that. Grover, you're the tax master. Assuming that we do have a President Romney and you're his chief economic advisor, how would you help Europe as they struggle to get out of this economic crisis? What kind of sure. advice or assistance would you offer to, your, to Europe on their economic crisis? Emigrate to the United States. Because yeah. uh, if... <laughs> Sorry, wait, sorry, you would... Emigrate to the United States. You would emigrate. Because if we've elected Romney... Quick, before it becomes Europe. Well, if we... <laughs> but you started the question... Most Republicans wouldn't let you in, is the difference. Uh, well that's we, we do need to uh, reform our immigration laws. Immigration to allow that policy, to economic um, policy. Mm -hmm. But as opposed to this president's. Um, but what we do have... Uh, we talked about spending uh, when I first explained the difference between the two uh, presidential candidates. On the tax policy, uh, Romney and Ryan have been equally clear. Uh, they want to move to a top rate corporate and individual of 25%. Uh, the European average, OECD average is about 25, 24%. The United States were at 39% when you count state as well as, as uh, national uh, corporate income taxes. And we have a worldwide tax system, us, North Korea, and Zimbabwe, um, which is probably not the way to structure your tax policy. So the good news is we go to 25 uh, corporate and individual, uh, and uh, the president is committed to uh, reforming immigration at a minimum to dramatically increase um, uh, talent, 
engineers, scientists, and others in the United States. I think we should dramatically increase immigration in general across the board. I think it's what makes us the United States of America. Great, we're gonna get to your questions uh, next. I'm gonna ask one more question of the panel. And here's something you might wanna think about as you formulate your questions. I mean, one thing I'm really interested to hear from all of you is what you think the people from your country, can, can, whatever country that might be, what they think that they want from the next American president. What is it that they think that they want? And then contrast that with what you think they need in your country, what they're looking for, what they actually need from an American president, because there's often a conflict between what you think you want and what you actually need. Um, so while I'm assaulting the panel. Can, um, I, can I just respond to one yes. thing? Because I, nothing could be worse than people walking out of this room saying, oh, the Americans on the panel think that the only way to succeed is to actually be in America. Um, I, it was funny and flip, but it's really not funny because it's actually, um, and, and Dove mentioned it too, this, this notion somehow of, of uh, American exceptionalism as being the only way and that, that somehow the only way to succeed economically is, is to move to the United States. You know, one of the things that, that um, uh, President Obama has done is increase trade significantly with multiple uh, countries, in, including um, uh, in Morocco. And, you know, trade is a good thing. Imagining that everybody has to live under the American system makes no sense. And I, I just don't think we can let a comment like that go by well, I without a comment. I certainly didn't say that, uh, number one. Number two, if you really want to talk about trade, no, it, but you derisively on, said, on, what could be worse, no, 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 what could be worse lady. than the United States somehow turning into Europe? No, no, no. You know, no, there are I a lot of things that could be worse uh, than the United uh, States well, turning into Europe. Look. And by the way, we're nowhere near socialism in the yeah, United States. Yeah, but you're States. working toward it. Look, um, <laughs> if I can finish a sentence without being interrupted, I'll reply to you. Uh, in the first place, uh, the notion, I, I believe that the statement that was made by the, by the president was something to the effect that, you know, we are who we are, but everybody else who is who they are, and we're not really that special. N being exceptional does not, as I said, mean that we are superior. What it does mean is that with the world's largest economy, with the world's largest military, with the kind of reach we have, if we start pulling inwards, and that's the implication, that if we say we're no different, then I think we not only undermine ourselves, we undermine our friends who want us to be there. I, I recall over and over again when there were debates going back to the 60s, and there was the Democrats leading them, actually. It wasn't Mr. Obama, because he was, he was barely born then, so that's not his issue. But Democrats wanted to pull troops out of Europe. The Europeans went nuts. Mr. Carter wanted to pull troops out of Korea. The Koreans went nuts. It is not the way of the world to want the United States to withdraw. That's Peter. number one. Number two, in terms of the economics, I was quoting what somebody else said to me. And the fact of the matter is, not that Europeans should you migrate to the to United States. It's not a matter of moving to the United States or anything like that. But clearly, something has gone wrong in the, Euro in the, in the Eurozone that is be proving very, very difficult to fix. And if you talk to Germans, to Swedes, to Danes, to Finns, to the people in Northern Europe, they're bitterly resentful of Southern Europe. You talk to Italians, you talk to Greeks, and by the way, the Irish, who are not in North or South, and they're very resentful of the fact that the Northern Europeans don't want to help them out. So what you're seeing is a cleavage in Europe that's due to a great extent to policies that were, A, bureaucratically driven by a, a Brussels that is still not very representative, and B, that has, in effect, allowed certain countries to live beyond their means. What Republicans are saying is, we've got to avoid doing that. And we believe that's exactly where the Democrats are headed. Dove, so I gotta let Peter out of his chute. Um, <laughs> okay, so first of all, on this question of American power around the world, 
even if we had this sequestration that Dove is warning about, you know, which I think is actually very, very unlikely to happen, we would go back to the defense budget over which Dove presided in the Bush administration. We'd go back to the 2007 U.S. defense budget. Um, so in a, a defense budget that still dwarfed everybody in the world. The Republican view about American power seems to be that American, America is more powerful when we have a vast military footprint that we have no way of paying for. I don't think the world is that stupid. The world understands that at the root of American power in World War II and the Cold War was our economic power. We, won, we, we were key to, the, to winning World War II because we outproduced the Germans on the factory floor. The Cold War was not won at, uh, through, through warfare, it was won because our economic system and the West's economic system proved more dynamic and more stable and more humane than its Soviet bloc competitor. American military power is only as strong as American economic power, and American military power that pushes us further and further in debt in fact, makes us weaker. And with defense spending at 50% of discretionary spending, and as much as Social Security, you can't seriously take a whack at this deficit problem, especially if you're also going to, you know, one of our Republicans has said you can't touch defense, the other one has said you can't raise taxes. So you're going to have to find a lot of money to find, uh, in, in a tiny, in a very small amount of pool of domestic discretionary spending. Yes, you have to do something on entitlements, but this is why I don't think the Republican Party is serious about this question. You're going to take taxes off the table and you're going to take defense off the table. And on something on this, on this question of American exceptionalism, at the core of American exceptionalism, if there ever was such a thing, was the idea that you were not a prisoner of your birth. That's how America identified itself vis-a-vis -vis Europe. That you could rise or fall based on the content of your character, in Martin Luther King's famous phrase, and that made us different. But the bad joke is there's less income mobility today in America than much of Europe. We are more of a caste system in the United States today than many of the European countries that we derive. That's the enemy of American exceptionalism, not the fact that Barack Obama actually speaks in a respectful way about other nations. By well, the way, I'm, Laura told us to be really <laughs> active and aggressive, so in case you're wondering. Well, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you all feel uncomfortable for one more question, and then we are going to turn it over to our gentle audience. Um, I'm hearing a lot of talk about strength, about power, about leadership. And I, I know that, that Mitt Romney has talked a lot about his foreign policy. He says that the centerpiece of American foreign policy is strength. He said that Obama apologizes, and he engages in dialogue with his adversaries. And he projects, well, he actually was quoted, quoting uh, Kissinger, who said that he projects an America, a weak America around the world. Romney says that if he were president, he would, quote, speak softly, but carry a very, 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 three varies, mm. big stick. And he said that pre this president, President Obama, speaks loudly and carries a teeny tiny stick. <laughs> now, I'm going to disagree with that because I think actually Obama speaks poetry and carries a silencer. In 2009, he spoke poetically from Cairo, right? to the Muslim world about mutual understanding. And today, in that part of the world, he's often referred to as President Hit List. We have, as I th one of you mentioned, we still have the Bush-era military commission's indefinite detention, the Patriot Act, and of course, an explosion of drone strikes against suspected terrorists. Now, none of you up here can say it, so I will. But the truth is that the President of the United States is a masterful assassin. Now, that may not be a problem for me, but I think it's a problem for all of you up there, actually. For the Democrats, I mean, how do you reconcile that with all that banging on and whining during the Bush years about civil liberties and due process of law? And for the Republicans, you're basically conceding defense and foreign policy strength, which is an area that you always had the edge in. So I guess I would ask you both, how, how do you square that? Obama's foreign policy and actually projection of strength around the world is a problem for both of you, all of you. Let me go Grover. to the earlier comment that America's strength and military strength derives from uh, its strong economy. And the stronger your economy, the bigger army you can have with 4% of GDP going to the military. Uh, and the more you spend that wisely, the, the better you can do that. Uh, the, I wrote a book entitled Debacle, which is about the recovery on, from the recession under uh, Obama. If you go from the base, the bottom of his recession to today and compare it with the bottom of Reagan's recession to, the, to 38 months out, uh, there, were, there are 10 million Americans today without work, out of work, who wanted to work, 
who don't have jobs, that if we had Reagan's recovery, they'd have jobs. GDP is 10% smaller than Reagan's uh, recovery was. And so the, the most damaging thing... They were totally thing, different kinds of recessions. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the Reagan one was deeper, and he had 10% uh, plus inflation two years in a row, 20% interest rates when, it, when he walked in, uh, and he turned the, the economy around. And again, we've had some growth in the last uh, three years under... Uh, Obama, the problem is that it is so weak compared to a normal recovery. By the way, his recovery is less powerful than all the other recoveries since World War II. It's just particularly bad compared to Reagan's, the guy who said, let's regulate less, not spend as much, and have lower marginal tax rates. And that's damaging, and that, but that hurts our capacity uh, to play a leadership role in the world more than some of the other stuff people talk it, about. It's convenient to skip the um, 20 years of other Republican rule in Washington since Ronald Reagan uh, with the same policies that have not worked that have put us in this place. Or Bill Clinton's but, raising of taxes, which, or Bill which preceded of the huge boom of the 90s. Exactly. Um, you know, Laura asks a, a, a big question and um, uh, about uh, the, the, whether the president has significantly changed enough uh, in terms of our uh, military outlook in the, in the world. And, you know, I, I'm going to defer to Peter as a, more of an expert on this than I am, but I, I will tell you this, that there is very much a sense that um, th the president is doing militarily sort of in, in many ways the minimum necessary. And unlike the Bush administration, he came up with a deadline in Afghanistan, much to the a deadline for withdrawal in Afghanistan and got attacked for regularly by the Republicans, although, as Peter says, now they've forgotten about Afghanistan, that the um, amount of money spent uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan severely weakened uh, the U.S. economy. And I think what, what we have with President Obama now is, um, uh, you know, the situation with uh, the worldwide economic uh, crisis is very much the driver of what we do militarily. And I don't see dramatic change, although I do think once we pull out of Afghanistan and um, uh, th that will make a difference. But I think we should look to the president's speech at the UN just last week, where he really talked uh, most expansively again, poetically. also in po poetically, poetically yes. um, about imparting uh, his values. We are not going to drive outcomes. We're not going to do what Dove said. We're not going to drive outcomes in countries where we are not in control. Well, we're going to partner. He likes quickie wars. You know, you get well, in, you well, get out. Look, with I no mean, it's not a matter of driving I don't think outcomes. it's a matter of liking wars. I think it's a matter of knowing what we're in control of and knowing what we're not. We're in an entirely different world, as we have been talking about for the last two days, than we were when we could just go in you know, with our mighty forces and our big weapons and change a, a, a you know, a communist nation into a, a, a democracy. That is no longer viable anymore. Well, and we, and we I think we, we President didn't do it then either. Obama understands yeah, that we, in a fundamental way. Look, oh, we, by we, quickie wars, I mean that, you know, you get in mm -hmm. Libya, you get in, you get out, no long-term commitment. Look, Laura, first of all, we didn't, I, I don't remember. You respond the, to a threat. <laughs> I, I don't remember the last communist country that we went into except maybe Lyndon Johnson's Vietnam. And last time I checked, he wasn't a Republican. They Grenada. Uh, Grenada wasn't real. But they real. denied it was communist when we did it. So That's right. Doesn't uh, count. That wasn't but the issue. But the look, threat. You know what I mean. a, a couple of clarifications. Peter was ver is right that defense is l roughly less than 50% of what's called discretionary spending, which is the money you can spend because you ch it's easier to change the legislation. But, but for European audience, okay? however, Wait, one second. For European audience, discretionary spending doesn't count. I was all about the to say that. That's okay. exactly okay. what I'm Which about to say. Which we have to, to do something about it too. Absolutely. It, Which, it, by the way, a majority of defense spending dove are entitlements. They're veterans' benefits. Is it that Republicans are more polite and don't interrupt? <laughs> <laughs> if you look at Social Security <laughs> and Medicare and all the entitlements which are quote-unquote off-budget, defense is 14%, not 50%. That's number one. Number two is, if interest rates were to rise 3 or 4%, that's the equivalent of the entire defense budget. That's number two. Number three is, if the problem 
is fundamentally getting beyond not a $600 billion problem, or certainly a, you know, a $100 billion a year problem, but a much bigger problem than that. You have to go after entitlements, and you have to do it by fundamentally overhauling them. Now, reasonable people are going to disagree, because there are people who believe that you really can't overhaul it without hurting the, the American people, and there are other people, myself included, Grover included, who believe the only way you can prevent hurting the American people is by overhauling entitlements. But defense is not the decisive factor. That's number one. Number two, I, I will reiterate what I said earlier. It is not that we want to go and invade. Mr. Romney has not said, for instance, let's go and attack Syria. You hear more of that, actually, from the left. What he is saying is, in the case of Syria, we need to do more to arm the Free Syrian Army and those who want to overthrow Mr. Assad, considering how many people he's killing. And, and you kind of wonder, why is it that we were able to do it in Libya, but aren't able to do it in Syria? And the answer, of course, is that Syria is harder. And it's an election coming up. And so it's safer to just wash your hands and if Mr. Assad winds up using tanks against his people, remember, Gaddafi threatened to do this. Assad is actually doing it. And our Arab friends around the entire Arab world are saying, where's the United States? Turkey is saying, where's the United States? Doug, we're, I'd, like we're to take to that, found. I'd like to take that opportunity. Where is the United States? I want to hear from some members of the sure. audience. Let's start with three non-Americans, if we can. And we're going to group your questions together and try to make them short so we can get more of you in. How about one non-American, two, three? Potential future American. And please tell us, <laughs> potential future American. <laughs> um, please introduce yourself. Tell us um, who you are, where you're from, what you do, who you know. <laughs> no, it works. Andreas Kremer Ecologic Institute from Berlin in Germany. Um, and I do have a question about the position of both candidates concerning the planet. Do they care about the planet, about the overheating, about the ocean acidification? What do they say about the protein sources from the sea? The 1.7 trillion that you will need to fix the water infrastructure in the cities and the states of the United States, how do they propose to prepare the nation to relocate all the infrastructure, including military infrastructure, as the sea will continue to rise? Fantastic, thank you. And number two was over there. Hi, um, my name's Alex. I'm a volunteer here and undergraduate international relations student. My Where are you from? Uh, from London. London, terrific. Um, my question was actually about something that Mr. Um, Zakheim mentioned earlier. Um, you seem to know more about what's going on and the feelings in Europe than I do, embarrassingly. But uh, speaking to a lot of Europeans, and there are a lot of Europeans in this room, um, I haven't come across the feeling of um, uh, the feelings of, of you know, disdain from one area of Europe to another because of what's going on, and I want to know where you heard that, and if there are any other Europeans who would like to care, care to comment later, if that's, that's actually what's going on. Thank you. Do we have one more from somebody who's not from the United States? Yeah. Let's bring the microphone. Just a quick remark, uh, at the Greco from Rome, I, I come from a, uh, a country which is in trouble. I'm not planning to emigrate to the US. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think uh, it's uh, some uh, Euro bashing has been on display so far in this panel. I'm not surprised by that, but I'm surprised that you are convinced that uh, a lot of people in Europe uh, is so skeptical about uh, their welfare system. Uh, I can assure you that the overwhelming majority of people in Europe is very attached to their welfare system. This is why the government are trying to preserve uh, them by introducing new measures. For instance, uh, the Italian government uh, has approved the overall of the pension system, for example. The end result uh, is is not clear at the moment, we are in trouble, okay, but uh, there is a deep conviction that the welfare system 
is, for example, as has been said, a factor of social mobility and something that can help to find a path to recovery. Thank you. Three questions were addressed to me, so I'll, I'll, I, I owe you both answers. Um, whom I've spoken to, um, I speak to Germans, I speak to Swedes, I speak to Danes, and I speak to Finns. And there is tremendous resentment, and it's not, maybe, you know, maybe in the UK you're, you're more fixated on whether Scotland will secede or not, but um, there is tremendous resentment, and you hear it from people not from necessarily only from government people, you know, the people who say, look, we've paid our taxes, we've played by the rules, these Southern Europeans don't. You, in Southern Europe, you hear what we just heard. We've got a terrific welfare system. What are these people trying to do to us? Are they trying to take away our welfare system? You know, are, are the Germans essentially trying to force austerity measures on us as some kind of penalty? Now, I am not your bashing at all. Um, I lived in Europe for six years. Uh, I, don't, I don't take a side, frankly, on whether Northern Europe is right or Southern Europe is right. My only interest is in a strong Europe. And right now, Europe's not as strong as it could be. What I was simply pointing out is that the European experiment, by the way, I did my doctorate in it, I don't know, too many years ago. Um, the European experiment seems to have gotten into trouble. And nobody really knows how to completely deal with it. There are people who say, throw the Greeks out. You know what? That's not going to solve the problem anyway. So that is what I was driving at. That this particular approach, where you have massive regulations, we heard about it, you know, constantly coming out of Brussels, unelected bureaucrats, it works out for some people, it doesn't work out for others, and on a macro level, it's clearly in trouble. That doesn't make me feel good at all. Americans want a very strong Europe. Uh, I'll leave aside whether or not Europe is an experiment for that's what somebody they called else. It when, that's what but, they called it themselves. Um, I, I do want to address the climate change issue because I, I, I think it's really uh, so important. Probably nothing uh, short of, of education, other than education, is as critical to the uh, global future of, uh, and the global economy. Um, innovation uh, is, is driven by it, and, and, and our future will be driven by good, solid solutions to the uh, energy crisis and the, and the global warming crisis. And, you know, the only thing I'll say is from, from the uh, Obama administration uh, perspective, it's a dis it's a disappointment uh, that more progress has not been made. And I think the president has been clear about that. But intent is there, and you know, who knows whether we can have more uh, progress or a sounder policy going forward. It, it I think, is noteworthy that in Mitt Romney's exception, uh, uh, acceptance speech at the Republican convention, he actually made fun of the president. He made a joke about the president for wanting to heal the planet. Um, you know, I don't think you could have two more divergent paths or views about the value of treating climate change as a serious issue than that moment that we e experienced. We have, uh, we have a Brit, oh, I was going to take three Americans, but you're our best ally, so I'll, we'll go with you <laughs> and then uh, you and then right, the woman with your hand up right down there. Thank you very and much. And again, one more just request. There are so many people who want to ask questions, so keep them brief and we'll be able to get to all of you. Okay. Tom, Tom Burke uh, from uh, London. Um, I come from a country that was exceptional once. It's not quite all it's cracked up to be. Uh, <laughs> but I do want to correct some misapprehensions uh, amongst our American colleagues about how the European Union works. There are no regulations that come out of Brussels that aren't approved by the member states. So it's the politicians in the capitals that agree to the regulations. And by the way, in terms of the problems in the Eurozone, it was German and French governments that first broke the rules on the corset on the Eurozone. And you can't have irresponsible borrowers without irresponsible lenders, which is, I think, something you've learned the hard way too. Um, <laughs> and I just want to say, that as we look from this side of the Atlantic at gridlock in Washington, I don't think there's much we want to learn about how to govern a complex continent 
from what your experience is. <laughs> you say? <clears throat> Hi, I'm, I'm Shepard Foreman. Uh, I live both in the States and in Brazil, but I'll ask the question from an American perspective. In my view, two of the most insidious threats at the moment to the functioning of the American democratic system are the uh, flow of money into the American political system and campaigning. And secondly, the incivility and disrespect with which we treat each other and the disdain with which Americans uh, now hold uh, both our political institutions and our office holders, including the President of the United States, um, which is really driven by punditry, the media, and uh, the wrath of the extremes of both parties. Uh, how do we fix it and reintroduce civility, respect, and uh, diminish the flow of money that seems to me to be undermining the um, American political process? Thank you. What, what, one more, and then, yeah, we're going to do one more. But thank you for asking for pundits how we get rid of punditry. <laughs> look forward to hearing. <laughs> look forward to hearing an answer. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Gauri Kandikar. I'm a researcher at Fridian, but I'm from India, and I've lived both in in Europe and in the United States. I have to say, um, just the quality of life in Europe and the average, a general average that experiences this quality of life is much higher than in the United States. There's no comparison. A lot more people live such better lives in the, United, in the EU than in, than in the US. Um, also the crisis, I'm sorry, the EU crisis that is going on, it was, it was also caused in the States and it left open some wounds that they were trying to fix. But, um, and even Germany has a better, bigger social system. But anyways, um, I would love your views on the 47% video that's going around and it would be very interesting. Thanks. We're gonna take one more question because there's somebody who looks like he has a good one right over here. Again, if you can just speak loud so that everybody in the room can Hi, hear. I'm Commander Chatterjee, and I'm unfortunately from Brussels. So, <laughs> and unfortunately, you work very closely with the Parliament and the Commission. So, uh, it's interesting what you said that a lot of people in the Parliament, probably the EPP group, are saying, well, look at what we did 30 years ago and the mess that's created. What, what I've heard is the reverse. Look at what we didn't do 30 years ago, which has created the mess, or what we didn't do 10 years or five years ago, which has created the mess, and what we're not doing now that's going to perpetuate that. That's one aspect. But seeing that this is about transatlantic cooperation, the question that I really have, uh, which I haven't heard in either convention, was one who was really about Clint Eastwood, and I love Clint Eastwood, but you know, wanted to hear something more about policy. And the other one was about, okay, what we didn't do in the last four years and how are we not going to do that. So the question that I have is, if, for both parties, is if, if your candidate were to win, what is your position on free trade with Europe? You know? And second, who do you think is your biggest ally in terms of a region in the world? Uh, that there were only three major free trade agreements that were agreed to uh, reluctantly by this administration. Panama uh, was one, Korea. Korea. Korea was the second, and Colombia, I believe, was the third. Colombia is one of our best allies, by the way, and it took forever to get that through. In the same period, China reached nine free trade agreements and has five more on the books. Free trade is not exactly the democratic strength. Uh, the party of free trade is the Republican Party. We don't have unions holding us back. Uh, and so that's part of the answer. I think there is much more orientation toward free trading agreements uh, and in the Republican Party and would continue to be if the Republicans won. That's the answer to that one. I'm not going to get any more into the European thing except to tell the gentleman over there. You see what that gentleman from the UK said? He's also from the UK, and now he's blaming the Brits and the French, so Peter. I stand neutral on that. I, I just want to say something about the 47. In the name of civility, I should say that actually I think Dove's point about free trade is, is right. I don't think the Obama administration has a very good record on that. Um, uh, but I think the 47% video was, was a, a, not only an important moment in this campaign, but I actually think I'm an important moment in this era of American political history. Peter, can you take a moment just to explain it? Sure. So Mitt Romney, 
um, to understand it, Mitt Romney was speaking to people in Boca Raton, Florida, who had given him $50,000 to hear him speak. And he said that 40% of Americans were not going to vote for him because those people were victims who were dependent on government, unlike the um, purely independently made Mitt Romney, who uh, grew up uh, with, a, with an extremely rich father who paid for his education. Um, and uh, what's, what I, th I think what is really important to understand, and maybe Europeans don't sufficiently understand it about conservative discourse in the United States, which is so much at the root of the way Americans, American conservatives talk about Europe, is that, uh, is that at the core, I think very near the core of American conservatism, as it has emerged over the last 100 years, is the belief that if you are dependent on government in any significant way, you are not significantly free, right? That, that, that basically there is a clear line between uh, getting benefits from the government, uh, like uh, um, as Europeans do more than Americans, uh, and paying a little bit more in taxes. And that is, in the famous words of Hayek, the road to serfdom. It's the road to North Korea. Um, now, Europeans might I find that surprising because they don't too. believe that they are not free. But what Mitt Romney was saying is that essentially we're becoming a nation of people who are not free because we have people like, oh, for instance, those American soldiers who came back and got the new GI Bill that gave them a, made it easier for them to go to college. Uh, or Amer elderly Americans who now get help with their, with their social security, or people who are on food stamps. And, I, and, and, and the, 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 um, uh, the, what Democrats, I think, have not argued forcefully back in response in recent decades is, in fact, what I think most, a lot of Americans in their gut actually understand, and Europeans understand, which is that the right kind of government interventions to give people some economic security and to increase their chances of economic opportunity actually make you more free because in fact they give you the, the social, the basic platform, the public goods that you need to actually rise based on your own merit. And I think this is a big part of the reason the Republic, that Mitt Romney is in trouble in this election and the Republican Party in general is in trouble because in fact most Americans don't actually believe that dependence on government in any form is a kind of slavery. The, uh, I passed out a handout that I want to share with you because if you take this home uh, and take a look at it, it, it gives you a rather deeper understanding of what's happening in the United States. Uh, this map is about state control. We have 50, not 57 states in the United States. There are 24 red states, meaning there's a Republican governor and a Republican House and Senate. There are 11 blue states where the Democrats have the governorship in both houses. Uh, and so the question of partisan argument in D.C., we have a Republican Party wants a smaller government, Democratic Party wants a bigger government, and what's the compromise look like, right? If somebody wants to go west, somebody wants to go east, how would you compromise? The answer is, if you don't want to go in the same direction, uh, it's tough to compromise. At the state level, we actually have states uh, such as Vermont and California, where the entire political establishment wants bigger government, higher taxes, and is free to do that as quickly as they want. In the red states, you've seen uh, tax reduction, uh, changes on, on labor law. You talked about how do you keep big money uh, out of politics. In the last 10 years, $4 billion have flown from organized labor, compulsory union dues, money taken from workers without their permission, over which they had no control on giving it, condition of employment, and on where it was spent. So that, at the state level, State by state, states are reforming that and saying if you want to make a political contribution as a worker, they have to ask you for the money. They can't take it and they can't get the government to take it. So watch these because states like Louisiana and Indiana, half of the children in those states, the lowest income half, this is the Republican Party saying the lowest income, 50 plus percent, can take the state's contribution, $5,000, $5,500 per child, take it to any school they want, public, private, parochial, uh, across the, the county lines and so on, that level of freeing up school choice uh, tremendously liberates things. 100,000 new kids in Arizona are freed up. The blue states are going in the opposite direction. And if you want to know what works in the United States, we don't have to wonder about how we compare with Greece, okay? We can say a million people left California in the last decade going to other states. State people are moving into the red states, moving out of the blue states. They're voting with their feet. Uh, and of course, the states with lower taxes, less spending, the, the uh, states with no income taxes grow dramatically more rapidly than the states with state income taxes. States that have right to work laws, which allow, don't allow unions to force you to join a union and pay dues, um, grow more rapidly than states that don't. 
this is probably not going to change too much in, in the next 10 years because they redistricted themselves. The blue states will be blue. The red states will largely stay red. On the back, it explains who's going to run the Senate for the next uh, decade. Uh, it explains that this election cycle, who's up in the Senate uh, on Republicans and Democrats. Uh, it, the Republicans, I think, will take the Senate narrowly this time. But if they don't, two years later, there are 20 Democrats up, half of whom are very vulnerable, 13 Republicans up who all won when Obama won in 2008. The Republicans will take either the Senate in 2014 or if Obama is reelected, they'll get to 60 votes in terms of control of the Senate. You can see how this looks. And then down at the bottom, it explains the strength of governors, state legislators, Senate, and House. It, it's a good sense when people, if, if Obama won the presidency by a point, and again, I, I think he's going to lose by a point, uh, but if he won by a point, somebody says the United States has gone blue, take a look at what's happening actually across the country, House, Senate, governors, state legislatures. This is a state that's moving in the direction of the, of the Reagan Republican Party, not the other direction. Let you me, know, uh, let Hillary, me Hillary's going to uh, jump in can here Can I now? just answer the question that was asked about civility? For one moment, I just, uh, Hillary oh, looked you want like, to go ahead. let's be civil and let Hillary. Oh, yeah, so no, you go want, ahead. Okay. That's all right. Thank you. Um, civility. We have a problem in our country, and you, pr you have seen it on other televisions wherever I travel. What we didn't have 25 years ago was a 24-7 television system, uh, much more than the internet, much more than the, the printed press. The TV system is geared to people belittling each other. And what's happened is that it becomes exceedingly difficult to relate to somebody from the other party. Now, in private life, we do it because more men than women are, Repu are Republican, white men, and more white women are Democrat. And since we still have marriages in my country, <laughs> then presumably either they're throwing bricks at each other every morning or somehow they get along. And believe me, I mean, my wife's a Democrat, and every morning the Washington Post sets us off. <laughs> but nevertheless, there's a certain degree of civility. It's going to be extremely hard to change the, the media. It's going to be extremely hard to change the press. But it, it's up to the individuals. And if enough people complain about it, maybe something will happen. In other words, if somebody is just too damned rude and loses an election, boy, will that get everybody's attention. That's what has to happen. Hillary. Yeah, I, um, just one comment on Grover's chart, which um, I think is, uh, too, is true, is that um, the Republicans are starting to feel like Mitt Romney is going to lose, and so they want to make sure that we all know that they're still really in charge of a lot. Well, I've been handing this and, chart out for six years, and, so I don't think by that By the way, the, I, I don't blame you. I think it's, it's, a, it, it's absolutely true. Yeah. The, the second point is if labor was so powerful, the, all those states wouldn't be red. Labor is not powerful, and um, it's, a, it's a sad state of affairs. President Obama actually, with regard to the teachers' unions, is the only Democratic president that's ever taken them on in a significant way, done a lot of education reform. But, you know, so I want to go to the civility issue that, that Dove and, and um, this gentleman raised. First of all, money is, has been kind of the story of this U.S. election. Uh, we talked about it a little bit at our lunch today where we're going to experience, uh, you know, $3 billion, I think, spent in, in U.S. elections uh, this November. An interesting fact, Americans spend more money on our Halloween costumes than we'll spend on this election. So put that in perspective in terms of overall spending. And which one's scarier? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> not, not, not entirely that, that much. And the other thing I, I believe we'll see, uh, but it almost doesn't matter now, I'm going to go a little off script with the Democratic Party line because I actually think that President Obama is likely to win uh, in a few weeks, and he will have been outspent um, by $700 million. And that is a very significant point, which, which says that in many respects, the, the real issues and choice that, that, that this election presents to the American people is breaking through. And that, that I think, is, is a, something worthwhile. On the civility front, I guess maybe I say this because I'm on CNN, but I, you know, we're the neutral 
um, network. But it, it, it does feel to me that the online world is in so many ways so much crueler and more intense than the cable TV world. I, I actually think that this election has been um, somewhat devoid of, of cruelty and much more engaged in the, in the choice. I, I, I don't see it as a completely uncivilized experience and maybe I'm too far into it, but I do think that you know, we're aggressive in our debate and we are um, uh, uh, passionate about it. And I really think that the distrust of institutions in the U.S., distrust of government and, the, and people being fed up has much more to do with um, just this sense of income inequality and, and, and the lack of, of enough jobs. We're going to do a speed round for our last uh, set of questions. Dove is actually on his way to the airport um, and has to leave in six minutes. So we have four terrific questions. Okay. We've got one, uh, and then you're going to start, and then Gideon, Chris, and then right over there. Um, see, if we, we'll squeeze you in too, but it's and you, okay? But but make it very very brief, okay? And I'll, that way we can get. We don't want Dove to miss his flight. Hi. He's um, got a holiday to catch. <laughs> Hi, Vlad Dutte with uh, CNN International. I have a question. We haven't talked a lot about um, sort of the social issues that uh, are surrounding the candidates. So I'd just like to get a sense from the panelists, maybe for our audience, um, how you think uh, President Obama and candidate Romney um, sit on the social issues, specifically with regards, for example, to I think something that many people in the audience are always fascinated about, which is gun control, um, and perhaps also um, issues surrounding women's, women's rights. I don't think that, um, that we hear a lot in, about that outside of the U.S. Thank you. Uh, Gideon Rachman from the Financial Times. Uh, it's, this has been an unusual debate and it's been so substantive and so much about policy and not about the horse race, which, so I'd like to lower the tone and ask you about the horse race. <laughs> um, I mean, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 my, it's certainly the impression we, get, we, we have in Europe that Romney's on the point of losing a very winnable election, an election that you know, all the numbers suggest he should have won. Is that, in your view, an accurate impression? I know Grove has already said you think he's going to win, which from the Republican point of view is good, because I was wondering whether the fact that you were here in Morocco six weeks before the vote meant you'd given up, but apparently not. But we're okay. grateful you're I'll, here. I'll walk through that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I will answer that too. Okay, and, and again, please make it brief. We've got to get up to the airport. So Randy Schoenemann, Foreign Policy Consultant, Washington, D.C., speed round. Uh, two for Hillary. You said because Barack Obama grew up overseas, he cares about people. Something like 22,000 Syrians have been slaughtered. How does he care about the Syrians? And second, you said climate change is important. He was in charge of the White House. He had the House and the Senate for two years. What did he do about climate change then? Thank you. Right over there, lady in red. Ana Maria Salazar, I'm with uh, Mexican media, but I used to be a Pentagon official. One fast question. I mean, when I look at this, the, the civility issue and, and even the way this discussion is taking place right now, the strength of a foreign policy depends on a cohesion within the country in terms of supporting foreign policy. So I'm not too sure, and this is a question, even if uh, Barack Obama is reelected, that U.S. foreign policy is going to be able to have the strength it needs just because of the infighting within the United States. So I think things are going to kind of get be the same, if not worsen, in terms of the role the U.S. can play uh, before the world. Arturo Sarukan, Mexican ambassador. Two of you are running President Obama's re-election campaign. Two of you are running Governor Romney's campaign. What do you need to do between now and November to ensure the win of your candidate? And final question, Chris uh, yeah, Coates. Yeah, I just had a quick question about uh, military spending directly to you. It's, it, Chris it, Coates. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Christopher Coates, Forbes reporter. Um, as far as military spending, you were talking about the cuts being terribly detrimental and dangerous, but is there any way that uh, the demands on our military, on the U.S. military uh, abroad, have changed in the last couple of years that would, might necessitate a reduction in these types of expenditures that we may, maybe not need as expensive, like? the expenses we might have needed before. That's six questions we have to remember. Okay, um, each of you, why don't you take... Yeah. We should let Dove go first, right? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll take first, Pretend where I, I meet the press and do um, uh, on, the, on Gideon's yeah, question, um, I read your column, by the way. Uh, 
Look, I think I agree entirely with Grover. Um, first of all, this ne isn't necessarily the 1948 election where Gallup was completely wrong and Truman won. But on the other hand, we've got these debates coming up. And I think the debates will, will demonstrate, I hope, that Mr. Romney is more than the equal to President Obama on a lot of the issues we've spoken about. If he is, then I think you're going to see the kind of outcome that Grover and I both hope for. So to me, these debates are crucial, partly because they show the people, the American people, and the world who watches it, perhaps, uh, what the two men are really like, as opposed to advertisements, or surrogates, or operatives, or spokesmen, or any of that stuff. So it's going to be crucial in this regard. That would be my answer to you on that. Um, on the defense spending, I would simply say this. If you take out the account that's dealt, that is called the Overseas Contingency Account, which is a special account that deals with Iraq and Afghanistan and is, is dealt with differently, we're still at a very, very high level. The reason we're spending more now than we did, say, when I ran the budget, which was only about $400 billion only, um, is that the cost of personnel continues to go up, the cost of equipment continues to go up, and the cost of operations continues to go up, in real terms, faster than the rest of the uh, consumer price index. It's just the reality of it. So you're going to have these huge amounts of money, which gets to the second part of your question, if we need to maintain our presence overseas. We've been very fortunate for a long time that we put everything forward we don't fight on our own shores. Europe fought on its own shores. That's why it chose to, to put together what's now the EU. They didn't want to do that anymore. We've been fortunate. We haven't been invaded except by our British friends quite a few years ago. And they burnt the White House, which many people think probably is a good idea now. I don't know. But the fact is that if you want to have a ship in the Indian Ocean, you need six to keep it going. And if it's a $10 billion aircraft carrier, I've just spent $60 billion. Do you, do Dove, I think go? we're going to ship you out. Yep, um, they're going to ship well, me out now. In the name of civility, here. ladies and gentlemen, Dove um, Zakin. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Have a good trip. Go. Hold the fort, Grover. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we'll reserve he your chair. He can handle for, it. We'll reserve your chair for Clint Eastwood in case he comes by and mm. wants to have a chat. Um, Grover. Mm -hmm. Did you sure. want to respond quickly? We're, we're going to wrap up in about five minutes anyway, but let's... Okay, I, I don't mind two-on-one -on -one continuing if people have questions, but yes, yeah, yeah, several very interesting questions. One was on social issues and guns. Um, and I love my European friends. I prefer their corporate tax rates. I prefer their school choice in Sweden. I prefer their tort laws. Um, I prefer their smaller numbers and poorer trial attorneys. Um, however, on guns, guys. You have never understood this about the United States. I serve on the board of directors of the largest and oldest civil rights group in the history of the United States, the National Rifle Association, which focuses on... Can someone wait? We need a shot of Peter's <laughs> face. Can we get a camera on Peter? <laughs> which, focuses on the, yeah. which focuses on the Second Amendment. And um, Hillary. <laughs> because sometimes our friends Thank at the ACLU can't count to 10 with only about seven stops. Um, but on guns, second amendment. This is a big issue in the United States. There are four million uh, uh, members of the NRA. 20% of Americans, when asked, will tell you they're members of the National Rifle Association. Uh, when you look at uh, turnout, and the question is, what about elections? Um, half of Americans are, are gun owners. Uh, gun owners track 70 to 80, 20 R over D. If you want to know why the Republican governor of Wisconsin survived a recall effort, it's because even the union guys, 40% of union members, were voting for him because he passed the concealed carry law. And that's in the United States, uh, a law that if, uh, originally, states passed laws to ban concealed carry. So you could carry a gun on your hip, but you couldn't carry it concealed. These were largely Southern Democrat uh, controlled states that wanted to disarm African Americans, and these laws were passed. We've been picking them off one at a time. Um, As it were. And <laughs> And we just got, um, well, you can, you can joke about it, but the crime rate, once a state passes a concealed carry law, drops dramatically in the, next, in the years following as more people have concealed carry permits. Uh, Eight million Americans have concealed carry permits. If you want to know one of the reasons why 
um, Obama's in trouble in a number of states, it's that he's been threatening to uh, support gun control. He's stated when he was a professor at University of Chicago, he didn't believe that the Second Amendment guaranteed uh, the right to own guns. Uh, and he's been acting on that basis, although without a Congress to support him, not terribly successfully. So it's a big issue. The other is homeschooling that isn't as big here except when Germany puts some guy in prison. Um, in the United States, we have one and a half million American students who are homeschooled, two and a half million parents who homeschool. Ten million Americans have been homeschooled at some point during their life. Almost all 50 states have very uh, small l liberal homeschooling laws which allow you to educate your child at home um, and, and, and not have to send your kid to the public school. Now, only about 5% of Americans ultimately will homeschool because it requires one parent to stay home the whole time. It's not easy to do. It's not a choice everybody makes. Uh, but if you want very high correlation between people scared of government control who want to be left alone to do this, and in every state, I want to party with the homeschoolers. In 50 states, they beat the, the uh, teachers union, state after state after state. Those are interesting people uh, and, and punch above their weight. So on social issues like that, they're, they're sleeper issues in the sense that people don't talk about them on national television a great deal, but they're tremendously uh, important issues. You also have, you talked about abortion. That flows in because under Obama's uh, Obamacare, the Catholic Church is told that if you own a hospital, you have to provide abortion, sterilization, and um, birth control stuff funded through any insurance that you give your workers. Uh, I just today got an email from every pulpit in Illinois this Sunday, a letter's being read explaining what this is. And it's not just Illinois, it's state by state. So that social issue for the 25% of Americans are Catholic, half of them go to church regularly, 10% um, of Americans are ex-Catholics, 25 identify as Catholics, and half of those go to church weekly, close to. That's the group that tends to move with these issues. So those issues will have an impact on, on voting. Uh, the, the question of what about Romney and what does he need to do and what about these polls. Um, all, what, what, what happens with a poll, and you get this from the comparison between some polls and others, Scott Rasmussen does one set of polls. He polls based on how many people answered over the last six months that they were Republican or Democrat, and then does his voter turnout based on those numbers. The polls that show Obama winning by, you know, five, six points or something, uh, assume that the turnout will be the same number of Democrats and Republicans as when McCain lost in uh, 2008, which was an eight-point gap towards the Democrats, not, whereas it was dead even when John Kerry lost by a point in, uh, uh, in, in 2004. So turnout's going to matter. Obama's spending a lot of time and effort to try and turn out his vote. Uh, one of the things that Ralph Reed, who helps to organize evangelical voters, points out is that from 2004 to 2008, four million people, white evangelicals who voted for uh, likely voted for uh, Bush, didn't show up to vote in 2008. Those people are likely coming back to vote, but they're difficult to count under likely voters because they didn't vote in 2008, therefore they're less likely by most people's sense to vote. 1.9 million letters went out a month ago to unregistered evangelicals in the 12, 15 targeted states. They're all getting called and visited to get them to register and get them to vote. How many will? I don't know, but that's those are the efforts that are being done on the, the Romney-Ryan campaign to move the uh, numbers forward. I think if you look at the polls that have an, a likely understanding of who's going to vote, that we're looking dead even. But of course, this election is about the 12 swing states, and you could win overall and still be punched through in Ohio or Virginia or Florida, and, and the D's really only need to take one of those unless they lost a bunch of other stuff that they wouldn't expect to. So I think it's neck and neck at this point um, uh, in terms of likely who's likely to win and uh, turnout and the Romney. And what should Romney do? He should just talk about focus on the economy and not get distracted by shiny things. I mean, he should have flown to Chicago and talked about school choice and teacher union power instead of talking about Cairo uh, over, over the last several weeks. He'd have done, had more people, the independents. In the United States, we have Republicans and Democrats. They've decided they're 95 percent one way or the other. It's people who tell you they're independent, and then a subset of those are truly not aligned. 
a third of those independents are Republicans who think it's cool to say you're independent. And a third of those are Democrats who think it's cool to tell everybody you're independent because it makes you an intellectual and I make up my own mind. Okay, so a third of those guys that tell you they're independent are non-aligned. They wake up every morning and they don't say, I'm always with the R's, and they don't say, I'm always against the R's. They wake up every morning. They could go either way. They're idiots. Well, they're the people who know the least about, about everything. Well, they follow it's politics. They're idiots. They, they <laughs> follow they're the, they're the least educated voters. <laughs> they follow politics the way I follow professional sports, which is to say that I vaguely know it's there. <laughs> but if you told me every two years you have to pick your favorite football team, I'd be going, I like their jerseys. Those are very nice. I, I'm not sure I'd pick on the basis that, that football fans would pick on. Okay? And so when I see the ads by guys, and I say, what are they doing? Well, they're not trying to talk to me. They're trying to talk to somebody who could go either way. Hillary, I'm going to let you respond. And Peter, you got the last word. I'm dizzy. I don't know where to start <laughs> after that. <laughs> but I'll, um, a couple of things, because ha- I love talking about the horse race, so I'll, I'll go to the strategy. Um, quickly, you know, I, I think it in raises a really important point, which was this was a winnable election for a Republican to beat President Obama. Um, But the Obama campaign was very smart on one issue, which is that rather than making this campaign a referendum on the economy, President Obama has succeeded in turning this election into a choice, as I said, between two directions. And there are three, um, so so that's strategy number one, why I think the president's going to win. Number two, um, because the Romney campaign, maybe Republicans in general, are not focused at all on the middle class. You know, the, both President Obama and Mitt Romney are interested in tax reform, but President Obama um, uh, wants to s- raise taxes on the wealthiest. Mitt Romney, actually, with his tax reform, would end up raising taxes on the middle class. President Obama focuses on creating demand in the economy as opposed to putting wealth at the top. Mm -hmm. And the final thing, and this gets a little bit to your point on the social issues, right now we have a gender gap in the United States politically of between 12 and 16 percent, depending on which state you're talking about. So overwhelmingly, women are supporting President Obama. And that's fundamentally for for a couple of reasons. Obviously, the so-called women's issues, whether it's you know, um, reproductive health, whether it's, um, uh, you know, healthcare discrimination, whether it's um, uh, um, families and, and things. But it's also moms worried about the economy, worried about somebody talking ab- in a language they can understand. And so I'll just give you these other two stats. I think Grover's right that it's a pretty close horse race head to head. You know, I think the president's up a few points. The most significant polling data of the last three weeks has been in these two areas. Which candidate do you think better represents you? Would look out for you? President Obama wins that almost 60% to Mitt Romney's, you know, 37%. That is a very significant shift. And the other significant shift is finally, just in these last three weeks, President Obama outpolls Mitt Romney on who is a better steward for the economy. That is a, again, a fundamental shift from where we were, you know, just a year ago. So those, those two stats in some respects right now are more important than the head-to-head who you for. Peter, because gonna, those are harder to shift. Peter, I'm going to give you the last word. The candles are burning low. Okay, and sure. The um, night is... So let me say something about civility. I actually don't think that by historical standards, American politics is so uncivil today. I mean, look at this, you know, in the run-up to the Civil War, people were physically beaten on the floor of of the Senate. Um, Even in the 1960s and 70s in the United States, if you went out to protest uh, segregation or against the Vietnam War, you were liable to be beat up. Um, We haven't had a presidential assassination in quite a long time in the United States. I actually think that if you look at the level of political violence, uh, which is the greatest form of incivility, we're actually at something of an historic low in the United States. Um, The big problem I think we have is not a civility problem, it's a democracy problem. It's just to say that that unprecedented income inequality uh, uh, empowers the wealthy so much 
The, the dis divide between capitalism, where you have as much power as you have money in your bank account, and democracy, where everyone is supposed to be equal, one person, one vote, gets eaten away, especially when the Supreme Court eliminates those few laws that actually prevent people from basically secretly spending unlimited amounts of money. And this is an enormous benefit for the Republican Party. I mean, one of the things you notice, you probably even know, you maybe even notice it on this panel, is that when people on the left in the United States talk about government, they talk about us a democratic government that we have ownership over. When Republicans talk about government, you notice my friend Dove talking about burning down the White House, they talk about them, as if essentially it doesn't matter whether the government is democratic or not, because it's a fundamentally alien, hostile force over which you have no control and which is a predator to you. So it actually serves Republican interests very well for government to become less and less accountable to Americans, because in fact, it fuels what they're basically running on, which is the idea of government as unaccountable, predatory, and something over which you have no power. And that, I think, is part one of the, one of the, in some ways, the fundamental challenge for the left in the United States. How do you make people believe in the possibilities of a government over which they have less power because, in fact, ordinary Americans are being disempowered in our political system? On, on, on the horse race question, Look, the e, you know, they have this thing where you can now bet on who's going to win. You know, that's basically showing President Obama at 80% you know, likelihood of winning. And if you look at the state-by-state -state polling, um, it's true, Republicans are putting a lot of emphasis on these one Rasmussen polls. But the state-by-state -state polling is basically showing Obama leading in even the states he doesn't need to win. Um, and if you look at a state like Ohio, which Romney really, really does need to win, I mean, that's now significantly not, e it's not even being called a swing state anymore, that Obama's margin is, is getting so significant in the state of Ohio. Why, why is that happening? Um, I think it's fundamentally because the Republican Party is still running in the America of the 1970s and 80s. The Republican Party is still doing really well amongst white Anglo people with children. The problem is they're down from 50% of the electorate in 1972 to less than 50% of the electorate today, and they're declining every four years because Republicans are losing Hispanics dramatically, they're losing single women, they're losing people with postgraduate degrees, and they're losing this very large millennial generation, which is larger than baby boomers. So they have this demographic headwind, which is coming at them, and it's faster and it's stronger and stronger every four years. And until Republicans can start to cut into that, especially amongst Hispanics. The Republican Party is going to have an enormously difficult time winning even when the economic circumstances mean that they should. And I think there's going to be, have to be a very deep and fundamental reckoning inside the Republican Party if it's going to modernize itself to have a chance in winning the much more demographically different America of today. Thank you, Peter. Um, Grover, thank you for your math. Sure. Thanks to this panel. You were fantastic. And to all of you. Um, Good to see you. I just want to Take close. It easy. Good to see you, close with one final thought. So for 2012, may the best man win, and 2016, may it be a woman. Thank you all. <laughs> Have a good night.